Hello everybody, welcome to another Technical Tuesday. Yes, this time you have me. I will be talking about provisioning. Now, I've been asked about provisioning a lot over the last three or four years since we've had this YouTube channel, and I've always held off making an episode about it because I've never kind of been in the situation where we've had to do a big provisioning job since getting these kinds of questions coming through. So I've never felt the timing has been quite right for me to do this video. However, we recently chartered a beautiful Seawind 1260, which I am in right now. This is the galley of the Seawind 1260. And we had a two week charter and I had to do, well actually Nick and I both had to do, the provisioning for that whole two weeks. And it kind of reminded me of having to provision for an ocean crossing or a big trip or whatever. And I thought, you know what, actually, now is a good time to do this provisioning episode. So, I apologize for the long wait, but let's get stuck in. People who might find this episode useful are those who are going on a long ocean passage, for example, perhaps doing an Atlantic crossing or a Pacific crossing. Uh, this might be your first trip. Usually I find that with experience, you kind of get to know what does and doesn't work. When I did my first Atlantic crossing, I was thirsty for knowledge, as much information as possible about how to provision for um, such a long time at sea and it was quite a daunting experience. I remember being very stressed about it. So perhaps if that's you, then you might find this video useful. Other people who might find this video useful are those who, like us, are actually planning to do a charter because it's actually not a million miles away from having to provision for an ocean crossing because you still are provisioning for quite a long time, a week or two weeks or however long. And obviously the stakes aren't quite as high if you don't get things right. You know, you can just go to a restaurant or pop down to the store, but you don't want to have to do that. So you tend to get quite organized in advance. I'm going to give you a lot of tips. We're going to be talking about a lot of different issues when it comes to doing provisioning uh, for these long passages or long time on, on boats. Some parts of this um, video will be more relevant than others. It's a windy day. If you can hear some wind in the background, then that's why. Okay, so let's get stuck right in. First of all, we're going to talk about what to buy. So that's an obvious one. What do you buy when you are trying to provision for, say, three weeks at sea? This was, I think, for me, the most daunting thing. It sounds really obvious, but I think it's very true. You should buy the food that everyone likes to eat. So whether you've got just the two of you on board, whether you've got four people on board, whether you're lucky enough to have like six or eight people on board, talk to everyone and find out what foods they, first of all, can't eat, of course, any allergy requirements or dietary requirements, but also find out what foods they enjoy eating and kind of use that as your, you know, first, your, your baseline. Second of all, I strongly recommend that people who are doing an ocean crossing or a week or two charter, they share the cooking duties between everyone. There's no real need that I can see for most boats where there should only be one person cooking. So if you're gonna have multiple people cooking, then find out, of course, what everyone is comfortable cooking and what everyone likes cooking. There is no point in buying food for meals that people are not going to feel comfortable cooking. And that brings me on to my other point. Some people love to plan out all their meals in advance and others take a bit more of a relaxed gung-ho approach. I do a little bit of both. As I said, think about dietary requirements, think about what people like and what people don't like, think about uh, who is cooking and what they like to cook and kind of use that as a bit of a shortlist of things that you should be buying. But I mean, I personally don't go so far as to actually like plan out meals. That to me is just way too much effort. And uh, it's just not my way of doing things. I'm organized, but I'm not that organized. So if you're a meal planner, by all means go for it. But don't think that that is necessary because you know, it can be quite intimidating to have to plan out kind of three weeks of meals. The other thing to bear in mind, I think, is to buy some special food or treats or whatever for kind of milestone events. So when you're doing an ocean crossing, then I think the halfway point, you should have something tucked away that's special. Perhaps like the one week into it point, you should also have something. Two week point, you know, kind of come up with these milestones where you can bring something out and say, we're having like steak if you eat meat, or we're having a beer and we can all have some beer, or we're getting out the chocolate, or I've got some treats stashed away or whatever. So I think that it's really important to have those milestones 
going to events celebrated by some nice food because that will really help with crew morale and crew morale is a whole other topic that I could spend a long time talking about but food is really a part of that, a big big part of that. Speaking of treats being tucked away, listen, when we had our first Atlantic crossing we had four of us on board. It was coming up to Christmas, it was uh, late November, early December. We were in the Canary Islands, stocking up, we were doing um, from Grand Canaria to St. Lucia with the Ark. And there were um, mince pies being sold in the Marks and Spencers in Grand Canaria. We bought two boxes of mince, mince pies. One went into the cupboard that everyone had access to, and one, I don't mind admitting, I squirreled away to eat when we got to St. Lucia. That was in our cabin. I, I kept that in our cabin. And I'm very glad that I did because there was um, one particular morning where we woke up and uh, one of the crew members said without any ounce of shame that in the middle of the night when he got a bit peckish, he polished off the mince pies. Bearing in mind there was only six mince pies to last four of us three weeks. So. That's fine, no problem. I had a spare packet of mince pies, but look, I'm not gonna judge you if you buy an extra packet of sweets or lollies or an extra bar of chocolate and tuck it in with your clothes or into your like personal bag or whatever and bring it out unbeknownst to anyone else when you feel like you need a little treat. In terms of exactly what to buy, obviously only you can decide that for yourself. There are a couple of, uh, well there's lots of on online resources actually, but one online resource that I want to point you to is The Boat Galley, uh, which is a book and also a website by Carolyn Sherlock. She wrote the book The Boat Galley some time ago and it is like the boater's bible for cooking on board. I don't have a copy myself but we have friends who've got copies and I've leafed through it myself and so many not only good recipes but very useful tips and tricks for kind of turning nothing into something but i think a couple of useful bits of advice the first thing is buy food that doesn't take up much space but actually turns into a lot of food so for example we actually have an example in the cupboard it doesn't take genius to work out which type of pasta you should be packing on a long ocean crossing or a charter if space is an issue which let's face it for most of us it is obviously spaghetti takes up a lot less space but you actually get more pasta than something like penne so i think that buying something like spaghetti is much more sensible than penne and the same principle goes for like rice dried beans over canned beans that are already cooked okay you might have to soak them and it takes a bit of a process again it depends on your priorities but from a food storage point of view, buying kind of dried beans and stuff like that is actually far more sensible. So think about food that doesn't take up much space, but actually provides a lot of bulk when it's actually cooked. Those are the types of foods that, first of all, they will last forever. Rice, pasta, dried beans and pulses last like years and years and years. Um, and second of all, as I said, you can just pop them, you know, in any kind of cupboard that you have available and uh, they'll last you forever and they won't take up too much space. So I think that those kinds of foods are always really handy. The other issue when you are thinking about what to buy before we move on is think about foods that are easy to cook in heavy weather and foods that people want to eat in heavy weather. When the winds are kind of just blowing you along and life is comfortable on board and everyone's getting plenty of sleep and there's no rule issue, the sailing is good, then you can kind of be pretty flexible about what you cook. I mean, we came up with some really crazy dishes when we did our first Atlantic crossing. I remember for some reason that still eludes me, I cooked a chicken and vegetable pie from scratch, including the pastry. I don't know what got on into me. I think that, you know, lots of weird things happen when you're in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and one of them apparently is you get quite creative with your cooking uh, when the mood takes you. You know, we had some really, really amazing meals and some of them were quite elaborate. However, that was on the days where the weather was amazing. On the days where the weather is less than amazing, you want a food that is hearty and hot and really fills you up and B, food that's really easy to cook. So if that's literally just like a can of soup into a pot, 
and it's heated up then great if you have the space for example in your freezer if you have a freezer we never used to have a freezer on ruby rose then you might want to think about having some meals that you keep frozen and you just put in the oven or put on the stove to to cook them like for example i don't know like lasagna or even just pasta sauce which you can then cook the pasta and then just toss the sauce through the pasta that kind of thing just stuff that is pre-made frozen and then you can just cook it very easily without any real effort and that will definitely come in handy i guarantee you let's move on to talk about how to store your food this will vary from boat to boat because some boats don't have any refrigeration at all um, and others will have multiple fridges and freezers most boats will have kind of limited cold storage space and limited kind of dry storage space but for those of you lucky enough to have like big lovely boats with loads of storage then this is less of an issue on this boat for example we have a huge freezer and kind of like a bar fridge size fridge that is probably about twice as much cold storage as what we had on ruby rose so from my point of view i'm looking at this thinking wow there's so much cold storage that's amazing if you're coming from a, a house then you might be looking at this thinking, geez, you know, that's like a quarter of what I'm used to in terms of refrigeration and free, um, freezer storage. So, you know, it all kind of depends a little bit on perspective, but in terms of how to store things, then it's worth remembering that first of all, only things that absolutely need to be refrigerated should go in the fridge. Only things that can be frozen and should be frozen can go into the freezer so when i say stuff like that what i'm really meaning is for example you do not need to refrigerate a lot of um, items such as mayonnaise tomato sauce or ketchup um, a lot of like dressings you don't need to refrigerate um, butter you don't need to refrigerate although you need to keep an eye on it um, because obviously certainly when you're in tropical weather it can go rancid eggs you don't need to refrigerate there's a lot of things that you don't actually need to refrigerate but we're all in the habit of, of keeping them in the fridge in terms of what to put in the freezer i think that's fairly self-evident what i would say is if you are freezing things and popping them in the freezer then it's worth thinking about how they are actually freezing down because as you probably know what happens is when you freeze something you can't then kind of stack it up as neatly as something that is non-frozen so for example if you're freezing like meats and stuff like that so you end up with a lot of empty space in the freezer that being said if you squish everything everything together and it freezes like as a big bulk then you can't separate it out so wrapping things up individually freezing things individually but trying to get bear in mind that you want to um, freeze things in a way that will maximize the storage space in the freezer in terms of how to store fruit and vegetables i think that's the main issue because that is something that you really want to try and keep going for as long as possible obviously and it's the one thing that you will find no matter how much storage space you have at some point you know your fruit and vegetables are start, going to start going rotten or they're going to start looking a little bit shriveled and not very nice wrinkly so it's worth thinking about how you're going to store them anything that you store in the fridge generally speaking you should probably be able to extend its life even further by avoiding doing certain things so for example if you cut up carrots if you're thinking oh, i'm going to be super organized and i'm going to like chop up fruit and vegetables or vegetables say for use in my cooking later down the line you chop them up and you pop them in the fridge that same vegetable for example carrots would have lasted longer if you hadn't chopped them up if you just saw them somewhere dry and somewhere dark once you start cutting things up then they won't last for nearly as long some things have to be kept in the fridge for example lettuce other things don't have to be kept in the fridge at all like tomatoes there's a couple of other things that you can do to prolong the life of your fruit and vegetables there's a lot of kind of kitchen gadgets that are sold Tupperware containers and whatnot you're probably not going to have the space in your fridge to be putting lots of containers in however items like reusable storage bags they will come in handy big time and things like cloth storage bags to store your vegetables in in the fridge they do prolong the vegetable life um, for some time so they're definitely worth having the other option is for some foods particularly meats and fish you can vacuum seal it. So this is not something that we've ever done before, but I know that having a vacuum sealer on board is something that a lot of people do have. So you can definitely seal your own 
items and then store them in the fridge or freezer and that will prolong their life significantly. The other option of course, and this is probably more for people who are looking at going into really isolated areas where they're not going to be able to provision again for some time and perhaps the quality of that food uh, when they do come across it is not going to be as high as what they're used to but that is canning and preserving your own food this is not something i've done before i've made jams and chutneys before but i've never kind of done any canning and i will direct you if you're interested to a blog post by a friend of ours bian she runs the website sailingtotem.com a really fantastic fantastic resource for cruisers who are either actively cruising or thinking about cruising planning a cruise whatever i'll link to her page below where she goes through her canning process because um, this is something that she's done many times before and she's had great success with it she cans like chicken ham all sorts of meat she cans and keeps on board for months if not years the other thing to think about and this is actually really crucial is getting rid of all excess packaging so for example we have a little coffee maker so we bought this little espresso maker at a camping shop here it is worth its weight in gold it is amazing it takes Nespresso capsules and so we are now buying Nespresso capsules. We usually try and buy the compostable biodegradable ones but um, they didn't get shipped to us in time so we had to go to the supermarket and just buy the aluminium ones which is a shame, I do apologise. But for example this has like a lot of excess packaging <laughs> going on, um, totally unnecessary. If I were preparing for a ocean crossing then I would be getting rid of all of this paper packaging popping the pods somewhere else in like a bag or something where they would just be not taking up too much room and then getting rid of all the excess packaging for two reasons one is that all that excess packaging takes up space that you probably don't have that's the most simple thing two is that a lot of the excess packaging is plastic and obviously once you take the plastic out to sea that plastic has to stay with you on the boat until you can find a good way of disposing of it. Bearing in mind that a lot of islands in the tropics, I'm thinking of the Caribbean in particular, they don't necessarily have the infrastructure on the island to dispose of plastics particularly well. They end up burning a lot of it. So the less plastics that you can take with you, in fact, the less plastic that you can buy in the first place, the better. The other thing to think about is how to dispose of things once you're underway so i will link to that resource down below so that you can check out all the rules for yourself because there are certain things that you cannot dispose of until you're a certain number of kilometers or miles offshore and it really does depend on exactly what it is that you're disposing so i will link to that information down below the question i was asked a little while ago was whether you should dispose of cardboard before bringing it onto the boat because of cockroaches and cockroach eggs obviously the last thing that you want is to be bringing cockroaches onto your boat just before setting off on an ocean crossing i mean that would be an absolute nightmare so i think for sure err on the side of caution from experience that's really only problematic in certain parts of the world um certainly in areas that are more tropical that's going to be more of an issue in for example europe i never kind of came across that as being a problem but if you are being delivered your fruit and vegetables in like a cardboard box from for example like a fresh produce market which did is the way that we got our fresh uh, produce when we were leaving gran canaria then I would for sure err on the side of caution and and not bring that box on board wash all your fruit and vegetables on the dock before bringing them onto the boat there's a couple of other miscellaneous items that aren't food but you still, still obviously need to take with you on your ocean crossing or charter or whatever and that's things like cleaning products that's things like toilet paper things like sanitary products for women and only you can kind of work out how much of what you need i do remember when we did our first atlantic crossing we actually attended a seminar on provisioning the ark provides all these seminars and they were so so useful and i do remember one burning question that i had at the time was how much toilet paper do I need on board for four people for three weeks? Like I had absolutely no idea <laughs> as that happens. So when I was researching this episode, I couldn't remember the answer to that because it was like five, six years ago. So I Googled how much toilet paper 
do you actually need or do you go through per week or whatever and obviously thanks to covid and the panic buying there is like hundreds of articles online about how much toilet paper you actually need so that information is very accessible at the moment other things like water we i remember when we did our first atlantic crossing we were quite obsessive particularly before we left about the water situation we had a water maker but we we're very worried about what would happen if either the water maker stopped working or if our tank got contaminated with seawater. So we had um, jerry cans of water on our side deck, um, as well as jerry cans of diesel. There were obviously, one was clear and one was red, just to make sure that there was no confusion. And we kept big bottles, like eight liter bottles of water stored in the boat, in the bilges as well. Even if you have a water maker, definitely try and take on board as much fresh water as you can so i hope that you guys enjoyed this episode something a little bit different and in a quite a different setting to what we're used to doing our technical episodes not sure it was technically technical but anyway i hope it was useful either way comment down below with your thoughts i definitely want to know any tips that you have about provisioning for long passages or for charter holidays let me know what approach you take to your provisioning are you the type of person who just goes around the supermarket with like a trolley and just chucks things in or do you do like a full meal plan for everyone when you're on board does everyone cook and help with the cooking or is it just one person who takes charge of that entire situation let me know i'm also really interested to hear if you have any other resources um, online resources in particular for provisioning and spending time um, at sea and how to manage that in terms of your provisioning so leave those comments down below let me know how you found this episode i really hope you found it useful and we will see you next week with a new episode thanks for watching guys bye